Well, welcome to chapter 8, and this is the great chapter of pronouns. In the two grammar videos for this chapter, we're going to go through three separate PowerPoints, and then I'm going to also tell you about a fourth one. Okay, so first we're going to learn interrogative pronouns, because those are just like relative pronouns, but they're much more basic and don't involve a huge mass of surrounding sentence. Then, after that, we're going to have a horizontal comparisons video and PowerPoint in which I'll compare similar pronouns at each case and number, so that we'll be switching between the various forms at every single row in the declensional chart. You will see in the bottom line here, there's an optional PowerPoint which you could use to drill and help memorize these pronouns. Then once you have learned these pronouns, then we'll start using them in sentences. And for that, we're going to move on to a third PowerPoint in the next video on relative clauses, where we'll cover both the interrogative aspect and the relative aspect. But that PowerPoint isn't shown here. And if you see the white slide, that's the one when you're supposed to give me an answer. Anything else is what you're not supposed to. All right, now there are two real ways to learn these pronouns. One, the worst way, is to memorize the chart and then kind of refer to your little mind's image of the chart every time you have a question concerning a pronoun. That's a good start. It's a good crutch. But with time, you want to move on to the second way in which you're actually recognizing each individual pronoun at the moment it appears in each sentence, understanding both its form and its translation, and then also its relationship to other things around it in the sentence, and then lastly, uh, what other pronouns could potentially replace it, those four aspects. Now, that's a much harder thing to do because, you know, you would have to know all five charts in your mind's eye and then be comparing them back and forth, and obviously this is not realistic in any way. No Roman speaker would do this. Much better is to hear or by eyes recognize each individual form that you see in this chart and in all the other three or four charts and be so familiar with each one of them that you just instantly know everything about it the moment you see it. So that's going to take much more work and that's what we're going to be working on in these videos is getting you to the stage where you can recognize each one of these forms and understand everything about it. So here we go. But the first thing you probably want to do is just memorize the chart, even though that's the worser way, still that will give you a start so that when you see a form later, you'll at least know, oh, that's where that goes in the chart. And about five minutes from now, I'll give you a jingle to help you memorize this. These are called relative or interrogative pronouns, who or which. And the blue and pink and gray are when you have only one gender. Quis here is indiscriminately who of either masculine or feminine. So when you look at this chart here, this top row is a little bit confusing. Um, qui and quai are who when you know the gender. Quis is who when you don't know the gender, either masculine or feminine. Of course, it's not going to be neuter because that would be quid, which is translated what. Okay, so since we're doing this, let's go right now through all the possible translations of this. So the top row is who, 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 which, and what is how that goes. Now you might look now you might look at these and say to me, "Oh, gee, well, um, a lot of these forms look really weird to me. What is going on here?" Well, the reason for that is because several of these forms are actually like third declension, which we're going to learn next chapter in chapter nine. So you know. You can start getting used to them now. Uh, like M, you should recognize that as an accusative, just like am um and um. So that's kind of normal. Is is pretty close to U.S., so that's kind of nice. Um, and then is became ibus here. That's kind of different. Is is kind of like when you stick it onto the end of a vowel. Ibus is kind of like when you stick it onto the end of a consonant, like Q-U. So... These are kind of going to be new forms that you're going to start getting used to in this chapter before you really get them next chapter. Also, these should look really crazy to you up here. Eus as genitive and e as dative. Whoa, you have never seen that before. 
Well, maybe a little bit back in chapter 7 when we had dative's. In case you forgot, these are common naughty nine endings. So there are these nine adjectives that get I-U-S and I instead of the normal genitive and dative singular. And you remember them through this mnemonic device, unus nauta. But in addition to them, all the four pronouns that you see down here are going to get this brown naughty nine exception today also. So get used to thinking of I-U-S as suggesting possession. That's kind of normal, though. I-U-S is just like in English, I-O-U-S. Like in English, if you should say, that person is religious or cementitious. So well, what does it mean? It means that they have inside of them, in other words, they're possessing it, this quality of religion or cementiness inside of them. So try to recognize that I-O-U-S you kind of think of it as an adjective, but it also means something possessed. So that's kind of the sense or understanding of that. Now that we're on this, why don't we actually go into exactly how you translate these? How do you translate these? Well, the top row is going to be, of course, who and which, and then everything lower down is going to be some form of whom, while which will stay. Okay, now, depending what row it's at, it's going to be either of whom, or to whom, or by whom, and of which, or to which, or by which. Also, there's the alternative for of whom in English, which is whose. You could say that. Okay, so when you recognize these forms, you kind of want to associate the English meaning with it just by sight. So, looking at the top level, Quis, qui, qui, all of these are who. Then at the top level down here in the plurals, qui and qui are also who. So it's kind of like who indiscriminate of which, how many number, whether it's just one or many. Qui and qui, you see that, are bo at both levels. So when you say qui, you don't know if it's one or, or several. And when you say qui, you don't know if it's one or several. Um, not so, of course, with quad and quad. Those are distinct. Okay, um, what about the other lines? Okay, well, cuyus here, you want to kind of associate that with whose. You know how they even sound identical. You know, cuyus, 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 whoses. <laughs> um, cui, you want to associate with to whom. Anything with an M, you just want to, that's, that's just your generic whom. Anything with a long vowel is going to be by whom or by which. Um, quorum, down in the plurals, or quorum, that's going to be of whom, meaning a group, or whose is meaning a whole group. Quibus will be either by or to whom, there's your dablative case. And quos or quas is going to be, again, just whom, meaning a group. Okay, so learn to superimpose these on one another and understand what they mean. Okay, now that we've seen where the chart comes from, here is how you memorize it. All right, the yellow here you don't have to worry very much about because you can probably remember those. Cuyus, of whom, qui, two or four whom, quibus, two or four which ones, or quibus, by with or from which ones. That leaves the pink ones. And then you probably won't have any trouble with the ablative singular, quo, qua, quo, nor with the genitive plural, quorum, 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 because those are exactly what you would expect. They don't violate any rules at all. So that leaves just the nominative and the accusative lines. So here's how you remember the nominatives and accusatives. It goes like this. Quiquem, quiquos, quiquam, quiquas, quad quad, quai quai. Quiquem, quiquos, quiquam, quiquas, quad quad, quai quai. All right, now you say it. Ready, go. And again, ready, go. All right, so if you can remember that, and if you can remember the yellows, then you're probably going to get it all, because the ablative singular and genitive plurals 
are very logical. All right, now let's go line by line through that chart and try to recognize each individual word. So first we're going to do the nominative, singular on the top, plural on the bottom. So who or which is it, or who or which are they? Okay, so when you see a peach border like this up around the top and bottom of the screen, that's just your clue to sit back and watch. This is time for me to teach you, and you don't have to do anything except watch it and absorb it. When you see a pure white screen, though, that's when it's time for you to give me an answer. So, so that's how this is going to work. All right, first, if you have a coup of a nondescript gender, you're going to respond, quiz. Who is it? But if it's a guy, you're going to say, qui. Who, who is it? If it's several guys, of course, you also use qui, but sunt. Who are they? If it's a girl, you're going to say, quai. Who is it? If it's several girls, again, you'll say quai, but sunt. Who are they? Uh, if it's one th neuter thing, you're going to say quad. That's weird. That came from id. Remember, id means it. Maybe you don't, because we're going to get that this chapter. But it used to be Q-U-U-I-D, and the U-I combined to make an O. Quid became quad, like that. So which one is it? And if you have many, you're going to say, why sunt? Which ones are they? Now, why quai? I thought quai was feminine. Well, remember, the neuter plurals down in the lower right corner of the chart always have a feminine-looking ending, even though they're neuter plural. You know, that's just like we have in English when we say bacteria, meaning plural many of them neuters, not the girl's name. Oh, bacteria, come over here! No, 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 it's not like that. You already know when you hear that, that bacteria and, and a genre, these are neuter things, not feminine girls' names. Okay, so I digress. Okay, so now we're going to see how well you watched, and you give me the pronoun. Don't give me Esther Sunt, that's not yet. Just tell me, what is this? And do all of these. I'm not going to say anything at all. You just say the answer and see how close you can get. Masculines. Neuters. A feminine. One neuter. Several feminines. One masculine. All right, now you supply the whole sentence, the est and put in est and sunt also. Here we go. What is this one? What about this? Yes. And this? and singular, and feminine plural, masculine. All right, so hopefully you're pretty good now at saying nominative interrogative pronouns. Now let's move a row down to the genitive. A possessor is indicated by this, whose or of whom. So if the possessor is one, then it's cuius. If there are several possessors, a whole group is going to be quorum or quorum. Okay, so if I have this shoe here, who lost their shoe? Um, whose is it? Cuius est. If there's plural, who, whose are they? Who is, whose is it? Now if there's a whole group of one, Quarum est, of which women is it? Quarum sunt. What now if there is a guy in the group? 
Now it's going to be quorumest. Why? Because a group with even one male member in it is treated at, grammatically as a group of males. Sorry. So quorum sunt. Of whom are they? However, instead of feeling that Latin is being prejudiced and bigoted, you could just think that, well, the masculine does double duty for itself and the feminine. Well, okay, I don't know. I shouldn't get into social engineering. Alrighty, so what if it's a neuter? Same thing. And sunt. Alrighty, so whose is it? You just give me the interrogative pronoun. Which What would this one be? I won't say anything, you just say the answer. Here we go. Ready? Go. What about this? Okay. What about this situation? Okay. And this one? Okay. And lastly, if we have a guy. Good. Or, plural, sunt. Alrighty, and then if it's neuters, worm. Alright, so this is pretty easy. Genitive is about as easy as it gets. The only thing easier than genitive is dative. Alrighty, so... Now let's practice. Um, I have a girl here, and she is possessing in her web of power this shoe. So what would you say? Oh, okay. What if there are several shoes? Right? What if there are several women, but only one shoe? Okay. And plural shoes? Easy. What about a boy? Same old, same old. It doesn't matter what gender he is if it's singular. And plurals. And double plurals. Good. All right, so now you're pretty good at using cuis quorum and quorum. Only three choices in all of that. Okay, so now we're going to get into the next row, which is the datives. How do you say to or for whom? Like, we want to give these presents to someone. To or for whom are they? Well, if it's singular, you say cui. And if it's plural, you say quibus. To or for whom ones, plural. Uh, these are third declension sounding endings. I and I-B-U-S. So, it'll look a little foreign. And I don't know exactly how you distinguish the sound of C-U-I from Q-U-I, because they're going to sound really similar, but it seems logical to me that you would just say C-U-I really fast. Cui, 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 versus Q-U-I, which would be like qui with a long matron. Okay, so if we have a present for a singular, we're just going to say cui, right? Simple. If we have two presents, we're just going to change the est to sunt. Simple, right? And then it doesn't matter what gender they are, it's still cooey, right? And if plural sunt. However, if we have plural recipients, now we're going to use the other form, quibus, right? And of course, if it's plural, we'll change it to sunt, to whom are they? And it doesn't matter what gender they are, still quibus. Quibus sunt. Very simple. Well, now you give everything. All right, so what is this? Just say it as fast as you can. Yeah. What about this? Yeah. What about this with a guy? Good. What about this? Nice. And this one? Good. And this one, good, alrighty, and with multiple guys, yes, and with multiple guys and two presents, with sunt, okay, easy. Now let's move on to something harder, the accusatives. Alright, so singulars have an M, or in this case a D, because of the neuter rule, id stays id in the accusative, and, or in the plurals they have an S or in the neuters AE, because that's the feminine sounding 
neuter ending. All right, so whom do you see, or whom, plural, which ones do you see? Now, quem here is a typical third declension ending, which we're going to learn next chapter. It used to be Q-U-U-M, so it used to look very stereotypically masculine, but then with time it became just E-M, probably because Romans found themselves using it for a person of unknown gender, masculine or feminine, and so they went for the generic third declension E-M rather than a fully masculine U-M but that's just my guess. It might have also just occurred because Q-U-U-M was hard to say. In any case, at this point, it's masculine, although always remember that the masculine can cover for the feminine if you don't know what gender you're dealing with. Now, I know you haven't learned S ending yet, but you can make it T in your mind if you don't like that. S just means you, you see. Also, sometimes I'm going to use habes instead of vides, like you have someone, like, in jail. So, so if it's a guy, you're going to say, whom do you have? Whom do you have in prison? If it's whom do you see, what will you say? Whom do you see? Quem vides. If it's a girl, quam. Whom do you have? If it's whom do you see? Quam vides. If it's a thing, what do you have? Quid or quad? Now, quid is more direct and simple. What? Quad is more roundabout. Which or which one? Which one do you have? Or which one do you see? Quad vides. Now, plurals. Now, if at least one of them is a guy, it's going to be quos. Whom do you have? If it, and again, whom do you see? Quos. Girls, obviously, quas. And whom do you see? Quas. And then plural, remember this is the feminine nominative sounding one, so it's going to be quai habes. Which ones do you have? And which ones do you see? Quai wides. Okay. All right, now you give everything and they're scrambled up, so good luck. What would this be? Oh, we got it. A guy. Good. A girl. One guy. Plural things. Guys. Guys. Gals. Gals. Plural things. Plural things. Alrighty, so we're hopefully you got accusatives. Now let's go on to ablatives. With which thing do you fight, or with which things do you fight? Quo pugnas. All right. So if it's a masculine singular, like with a sword down here, you're going to say quo. If it's plurals, you're going to say quibus. Doesn't matter what gender it is. If it's a feminine singular, you're going to say qua. I fight with a pen. Okay, and if it's plurals, it does again, it's quibus. And then if it's a neuter singular, it's quo, and plurals, it doesn't matter, gender, quibus. Alrighty, so here we go. Now you give everything. Okay, so what about this? Blank pugnas. Good. And this? Okay, and this? And these, same thing as masculines. And this. Okay, and 
plurals. Yeah. All right. So to review, you have hopefully gotten pretty far along the way towards memorizing this chart. We're going to use this much more in all the other PowerPoints. So if you haven't, don't worry. Just keep on moving. But just work on recognizing each and every form. And that might mean that you have to go slowly and slow down the video. You know, use the little gear down in the lower right corner to set it to three-quarter speed or half speed so that you can make the mental connections between each thing and not just gloss over it and think you know it when in fact you haven't really learned it. And of course recall that this is how you translate these. Who, whom, and whose, and which. And the entire next video, 7b, is going to be on these pronouns and in particular on how they are used in relative clauses. So we are going to turn all these interrogative pronouns into relative pronouns merely by using them in a different way. In a relative clause. All right, see you there. Okay, so so far we've learned the relative pronouns, but now we're going to learn a whole bunch of other pronouns too. We're going to learn demonstrative pronouns, hik, hik, hok, and illa, illa, illud. We're going to learn personal pronouns, is, ea, id. Um, we already learned earlier the relative pronouns, qui, qui, quad. And then we're also going to get uter, utra, utrum. So all these pronouns are very similar. They all follow the same patterns as you can see in the slide here. So I want to give you this slide for those of you who are photographic memory people who like to see the whole thing in one spot. Um, now, in this slide, a gray circle represents a soft sound, while a black square represents a hard sound. So that's meant to draw your attention to where the hard sounds are in the chart. Now, I've only marked the problematic ones here. There are a whole bunch of these that are always hard, but these in general should be remembered by some other distinguishing feature, such as high or low or rising pitch. And that's what we're going to do in, at the start of this video. I'm going to take you through all the irregularities and idiosyncrasies of all of these charts to at least point them out to you and to help you get closer to not confusing them as you're likely to do early in your career anyways. So I want to try to give you the greatest help that I possibly can so that you are making progress toward getting all of these accurately rather than making the same old mistakes over and over just because nobody pointed out to you the distinguishing features of the charts. So that you maybe, for instance, write H-U-M instead of hunk. So that's what we're going to do in the first half of the video. And if you'd like no frames, here it is without the frames. Then in the rest of the PowerPoint, we're going to practice all of these in a real life situation with seeing actual people on the page. So, first a little syntax. Anything with a yellow border like this around here is where you can just sit back and relax and watch. You don't need to do anything. Only on the white slides do you need to give me an answer. All right, so first here are some personal pronouns that we've learned, except we haven't learned the nominatives. Um, and some of these have third declension-ish forms, which you won't see until next chapter nine. But Note here that these have this naughty nine exception. And all these words you see down here below are the naughty nine, the ones that get this naughty nine exception, with ius in the genitive and e in the dative. Now, all the pronouns that you're going to see in for the rest of this video are going to get this naughty nine exception. So So, our, now, now we're not going to see the unus nauta pronouns here, except for uter, utra, utrum, but we will see the ones in orange here, is, hic, illa, and ipsa. And the first thing we're going to do is work on memorizing these four charts. Now I'm going to skip ipsa because it is identical to illa. So you don't need that, but we're going to go 
is hic illa, and then we're going to redo qui. Here we go. All right, several rules. First, start with is, ea, id, he, she, it. Memorize the chart, and the four yellow lines that you see here have no gender, obviously. They're in black. Okay, so notice these e's up here. Everywhere on this chart right now that has an e, but I'm going to take away these three readies. So notice that is, ea, id has this exception in these three places. So is and id are the two exceptions. Why would that be? You might think to yourself, well, obviously, because if you said S, E, S over and over, wouldn't it slowly change into is? Because it's kind of just natural, right? S, 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 S. So that's how words can evolve throughout time. Same with ed. If you were saying ed over and over, it would slowly become id, wouldn't it? Especially if there's no writing and only speaking going on. So these disappear. And when you do that, you've got the correct complete chart. Isn't this one easy? There's only two and a half little exceptions in this whole chart. Everything else follows all the rules that you would expect. The stem is E, and you put on the normal ending. Of course, the naughty nine endings are kind of exceptions, but I already covered those. Okay, so now we've got one of the four charts. Let's go to the next chart. Ila, Ila, Ilud. To get this chart, we're going to change the E's to Il, which means that one way over there. So let's do that. Drop an Il, meaning that one over there. So now we've got Il everywhere, but there's still a, another exception we need to make in these three places that were messed up in the last slide. What, is, what are those exceptions? Well, we're going to drop in an E or a U. So once again, these three places are problem spots. In the last slide, it was I instead of E. Now it's E and U. Now why would you get this? Well, this one was IS, so they didn't know what to do with that. They just replaced it with an E, IL. And this one was ID, and over time, if you said ILID, wouldn't it slowly become ILUD? Isn't U a more pleasing sound before a grunting D than a flimsy I? Yeah, it is. So the U's here are pretty logical. The E is not so much. Except that you do remember for the E that your vocatives, marke, have that E there in the masculine. Marke. Omifili marke. Remember that? Way back then? All right. And this is indeed the complete chart, as you'll see when I click this and nothing will change. Check mark. We have checked off a second of the four charts off the block, but the next two are going to be hard. Oh, boy. All right. So next up, we're going to do hick, hike, hawk, meaning this one. So to get hit hike, hawk, E and in some cases I, now, wait a second, what is EI? Well, remember, that's a result of your naughty nine endings here, EI, okay? So wherever you have EI like that, basically in the naughty, not to, in the naughty nine exception area, it's going to become HU. Everywhere else, E is just going to be, so E will become H and EI will become HU. Oh, that's kind of nice and easy. What else, though? Uh-oh. The singular derived endings will get a C, and you'll see this in a second at the end. And what does that C mean? It means here. In all the Romance languages, Italian, French, Portuguese, you know, when they have a C, like qu'est-ce que c'est que ça in French, that C syllable denotes an extra emphatic here. So hikai cock is literally not just like this, but this one right here. All right, so how do we do this? First, our three unusual forms are going to get a weird ending. O in the neuters and no S here on the masculine. Chunk. Next comes in H or HU. After that, the Feminine derived endings, which is the feminine and then the neuter plurals, which are always are identical to feminine singular. No idea why, but 
those are the three feminine derived endings. Those are going to get AE because it was a mess. You see, up here we had A, and then in the plurals we had AE, and then over in the neuters we had EA. Ah! And the Romans just gloss right over that and say, hey, we're all going to do AE. All the feminine derived ones are going to do AE. So I, just pronounce it I. Very simple. So now, isn't it nice? Feminines are high and high and high and high. Oh, this is looking really cool. And now, last of all, is where we're going to get that C suffix meaning right here. And notice in these three areas that are slightly darker green that it's actually going to distort the stem. So we'll come back and look at those. Here it comes in. Now what happened in these three stem distortion areas? M changed to N, and that's normal because you can't even say hump, can you? You cannot say M before C. It will naturally always change to NC. So that happened right here in these two masculine and feminine areas. And then what else happened? Well, up in the dative singular, the macron got lost before the C. So E -E became weak with no macron. But that kind of makes sense because C will force you to rush the sound. Because if you need to spit out the air to make the k burst of air, then you're not going to be able to hold it in for a long I. So it's natural that wherever you see I, C, it will always be short. All right. And that does it. That is the complete Hickeycock form. And notice the C is not everywhere. It's only up there in the singulars and two of the neuter plurals. All right, so let's review the irregularities and distortions that we just had and see if you can remember what they each were. What was this one? H-U, remember? Yep. You could have also said it was the naughty nine distortion, I-U-S and I. What about this one? What was this one? Well, this was the no E. There was no E here. Remember that in is a id All right, what about this one? That was the unusual endings. Yes, they're a doozy. What about this? This was the A-E gloss over in Hick Hike Hawk. And what was this? That was the C suffix, meaning right here. And this? That was the C suffix distorting the stem. M to N and no macron. All righty. So once you've got all that, then it's pretty smooth sailing. All right, so now let's go through each of these four charts of pronouns. And on each chart, I want you to tell me which of these seven exceptions, the four up here above me, and then the three over there on the other side make seven. Which of these seven exceptions does this is a id chart get? Stop the video if you want to think a little bit. Answer? It gets just the no e exception. That's it. Remember? That was the easy one. All right, next chart. Which of the seven exceptions, four above and three on the other side, does this illa illa illud chart get? Answer? Really just the unusual ending, e and u. So basically, you have two charts that only have the unusual ending exception. But one is no e and the other is e or u. All right? What about the next chart? Which of the seven exceptions does this chart get? Hit Kai Kok. Answer? Everything except the top left corner, no E. Even HU right here. Okay, so at this time I want to point out an optional second PowerPoint that you can use on your own time to train yourself to memorize the various power, um, pronouns. So far, we've only had the qui, qui, quad, interrogative, and relative pronoun, but there are actually four or five of them. And so you can use this optional irregular pronouns chart drill to drill yourself over and over in harder and harder ways until hopefully you can produce all these charts on your own. For instance, in the qui, qui, quad section of it, um, first, you, what you are doing is 
seeing all the various forms come in and then after that what you're doing is clicking on the correct box to put them where they go and hopefully you don't make a mistake somewhere like that and have to start over but um, yeah hopefully that'll work and over here you also put the translation after that the third one is where you're just clicking on one and putting it where it goes and same with the translations like that so hopefully you can get them all right without messing up so this PowerPoint has is a id and qui qui quad and hikai kok and ila ila ilud and in, you'll learn the rest of these in the rest of the video now I want to draw your attention to this ce suffix here in the genitive singular I put that in to create uniformity among all the singulars so that they all now have c in them but this CE, CE is actually pretty rare, and it does exist, however. It certainly does exist sometimes, but usually it's just huyas. So, you know, that's something to be, so that's something to be aware of. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is not to confuse hick with heek. This is a chart from your grammar charts. You can see the link down in the video's description down below. Um, hick means this one. Heek is related to it, but it means here. So one has a short eye and the other has a long eye. So make sure your ear keeps those two straight. Hick hike hawk versus heek and illeek for here and there. All right. Now that we've learned where these charts come from, here is a jingle to help you memorize it. Okay, so first we notice that the yellow ones here, you can probably remember since they only have one form. Huyas, huik, and he's. But then the problem then becomes the nominatives and the accusatives. So here is a jingle to help you remember just the nominatives and the accusatives from each line. He kung ki hos, hai kan kai has, ha kok, hai kaik. He kung ki hos, hai kan kai has, ha kok. Hi, Kike. Now you say it. Ready, go. And again. Ready, go. Of course, this is just like, remember, qui quem, qui quos, qui quam, qui quas, quad quad, qui quai. Okay, in all of these, I'm going to ask you a question using a form of utrum. I'm going to ask, which one was it, using this formula here, uter est, or some other gender and number of it. And depending on which gender it is, you're going to respond either with the left column, the middle column, or the right column. And then if I asked it in the plurals, you would respond with either the left column, the middle column, or the right column. So we want to work on moving through these columns. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot in this. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to demonstrate it in the yellow slide, and then I'll ask the question on the white slide, and you give it. Um, after we do all the demos like this, then I'll have you do it one more time just from memory without being prepped to see if you picked it up or not. All right? Uterest. Hik. Is. Ille. Uterest. Utri sunt, sunt he, sunt ei, sunt ili. Utri sunt, feminine singular, utra est, est haik, est ea, est illa, utra est. Feminine plural. Utrai sunt. Sunt hai. Sunt ei. Sunt illai. Utrai sunt. Neuter singular. Utrum est. Est hoc. Est id. Est illut. 
Ultramast. Neuter plural. Ultra sunt. Sunt haik. Sunt ea. Sunt illa. Ultra sunt. All right. Good. You did it. Now comes the test. See if you can do it from memory. I'm just going to ask the question. And remember, you're going to do one of these columns. Or in the plural, one of these columns. Uter est. Hope you got it. Utri sunt. Utra est. Utrai sunt. Utram est. Utra sunt. How'd you do? All right, if that was hard, the next two, genitive and dative, will be easier. All right, so if I ask utriusest, of which one is it? Doesn't matter what gender it is. You can say huius or huiusque if you want to be cool, eius or ilius. Of course, down in the plurals, gender does matter, but it's really easy, as you can see. It follows all the rules. All righty. Utrius sunt. You can respond, huius, eius, ilius. Utrius sunt. Utrarums sunt. You can respond, harum, earum, ilarum. Utrarum sunt. If it's masculine plural, utrorum sunt, or neuter plural, you can respond horum, eorum, ilorum. Utrorum sunt. All right, now, completely from memory, I'm just going to ask the question. Remember, this is what you can answer, and in the plurals, that. Utrius est. Utrarum sunt. Utrorum sunt. All right, that was easy, wasn't it? This will be even easier. Dative's. If I ask Utri est, two or four, which one is it? You're going to respond with one of these, regardless of the gender. Quick, e, ili. And if I ask Utri's est, you're going to respond he's, e's, ili's, one of those. Utri est, you can respond quick, e, -i or ili utriest and if it's a guy utriest you're going to respond with the exact same thing but if it's plural utriest you can say he's at ease or illis. Isn't that easy? Utris est? And if it's a guy, utris est? You're going to respond with the exact same thing.
All right, now let's do it from memory. You can respond with quick, a, ili, or he's, or e, ili's. Utri est. Utri est. Utri's est. Utri's est. Okay, now to the accusatives. If I ask Utram habes, which one do you have? You're going to respond with the masculine column, the feminine column, or the neuter column. Hunk eum ilum, hank eam ilam, or hoc id ilud. And in the plurals, it's going to be pretty regular, except for hike. All right, utrum habes. You may respond hunk eum or ilum. Utrum habes. If I ask Utram habes. You can say hank, eam, ilam. Utram habes. If I ask utram habes and it's neuter, obviously, from the picture, not masculine, you can respond hawk or even hawk heek. This one here. Or id or ilud, ilik. Utrum habes. And if it's masculine plural, utros habes is exactly what you'd expect. Hos, eos, ilos, utros habes. If I ask utras habes, you can say has, eas, or ilas. Utras habes. And neuter plural, utra habes. You can respond hike, ea, or ila. Utra habes. All right, now from memory, I'm going to just ask the question, and you got to respond with one of these. And in the plural, one of these. Utram habes. Utram habes. Utram habes, and it's neuter. Utros habes. Utras habes. Utra habes. Good. Now on to the ablatives. If I ask utro pugnas, you can respond hok, eo, or ilo. If I ask utra habes, you can respond hak, ea, or ila. And the neuters are the same as the masculines. In the plurals, it doesn't matter gender. You just respond he's. Eis or illis. Okay, so if I ask utro pugnas, you can respond hok, eo, or illo. Utro pugnas. And if I say utris pugnas, you can respond he's, eis, or illis. Far off in the distance. 
Ku tri spugnas. Ku tra pugnas. You can respond pak, ea, or illa. Utra pugnas. So, now completely from memory. Again, these are your forms in the singular, and the plural is easy. Utro pugnas. Utris pugnas. Utra pugnas. Utris pugnas. Temere. Randomly. Uh oh, pop quiz. How well did you learn the whole thing? Dun dun dun. Heart pounding. Uh oh. Okay, so here we go. Utram habes. Utro pugnas. Utrai sunt. Utrarum sunt. U tri est. Uter est. U tris pugnas. Ultra sunt. Ultram habes. Ultra est. Ultri est. Utrorum sunt. Utrum est. Utras habes. Ultra pugnas. Ultra habes. Ultri sunt. Ultri sunt. Utros habes. Utris est. Utro pugnas. Utrum habes? The end.